And I want to argue today um, that one way to map the development of uh, conceptual writing uh, over the course of the last two decades is to attend to um, how certain works come into dialogue with changing cultural backgrounds, um, establishing you know, feedback loops of, of either you know, reflective, uh, reflexive resonance um, with non-poetic texts and structures, while others accordingly fall out of sync um, at the same time. So I want to propose in brief that one might, in a very schematic way, uh, compare the conceptualism of the mid to late 1990s, which was aligned with a sort of early internet, uh, to the affinity of more recent conceptual writing with the social media networks that predominate and structure online culture today. So where certain texts from the last years of the 20th century seem newly relevant because of the ways they read against the background of what, what has come to look like Web 1.0 with its more static, humanly curated database structure. Other types of texts seem newly relevant today because of the way they read against the background of an internet experience. It's more algorithmic, interoperable, ephemeral, streaming, mobile, uh, affective, and narcissistic. Um, so about a decade ago, I argued that one of the ways um, that we could think about uh, work that was soon to become called conceptual writing um, poems from you know, around the turn of the millennium by writers like Judith Goldman, uh, Larissa Lai, Kenneth Goldsmith, Dan Farrell, works that um, seemed like they were doing something new, um, might be thought of in relation to their contemporaneous media landscape and uh, the advent of what was then starting to be called new media. And my argument in short was that even though most of those works um, had not taken advantage of computational data analysis or the affordances of electronic media. They were, they were composed longhand um, or maybe on a word processor but published as conventional printed books. That they might nonetheless be considered works of new media because they exhibited the structural logic of an interface and a database. So um, Christian books, you know, to, to, to take a well-known example, could be seen as the interface to the database of the 1976 edition of Webster's Third International Dictionary if the search query was something like return all of the univocal lemmata uh, and sort them according to vowels. So th these were works that, I, you know, I argued that privileged new ways of accessing and organizing and visualizing large quantities of previously accumulated data rather than creating new material uh, or pioneering new styles. So that was precisely Lev Manovich's definition of the new media avant-garde. Now to some extent, of course, uh, you know, the world of the database aesthetic very much still with us and indeed uh, the database structure of large data-driven uh, institutions has only become more entrenched and pervasive if you think of um, you know, government surveillance or uh, epidemiological breakthroughs in healthcare or targeted retail sales and, and so on. But the nature of the internet, I think, has also changed as well, um, though none of, none of those changes is starkly differentiated as something like, um, you know, Web, web 1.0 or Web 2.0 would suggest, um, as, if, as if we could measure these in neat, uh, you know, one-tenth uh, increments, but I'm thinking of general trends that might be graphed to an increase in the ratio of users to content creators, um, even to the point where what used to count as use itself now qualifies as the creation of content, right? Users have increasingly become the products uh, rather than the clients of internet businesses, right? You don't, you, that is, you, you don't go to Facebook um, because of the great content that Facebook has generated for you or that their, their hip experts have curated for you, you go to Facebook to create that content for them to post, to comment, um, and in the process, you, your activities and your data are commercialized, right? You don't so much Google something as you are Googled um, in the process. Their business model is not, not interested in providing you with data so much as it is in gathering um, your data. Um, and there are two, there are two corroborating uh, measurable benchmarks of this change. First, there's a reduction of hyperlinks on any given page to external domains. Um, and instead, so you find an increased number of 
links to other pages within the same site or to embedded elements um, that are loaded within the same page. Uh, and second, there's an increase in account creation and login requirements um, to use a site or even to access a page because the new business models don't, don't require um, selling you something as much as keeping you on the same site so that they can record your data and sell you uh, sell your presence to someone else. At the same time, earlier forms of production have tended to give way to shorter form, or indeed form restricted or character restricted, uh, character count limited, commenting um, and tagging, while the large scale cut and paste reframing um, suggested by the text display of Web 1.0 has yielded more to acts of countersigning um, as files from different media types get perpetuated and shunted uh, and reposted in relays across platforms. So again, you don't so much go online, take a text or, or even an image or an audio file, take it back offline, instead you share it, you reblog it, um, you retweet it, you embed it, you work with it via a cloud-based app, you stream it, you affirm it with a click of a button, uh, or you demean it with a snide comment, but you keep it circulating on the web, um, and a web that we're connected to with increasing continuity um, when, um, on you know, on, on the table, in your pocket, <coughs> on your wrist, um, and not reliant on, um, on furniture, um, not, not needing to be connected uh, to a modem usurping your landline or something like that. Um, and again, the formal symptoms of this trend uh, extend beyond, you know, the, the merely anecdotal. At a scripting level, the promiscuity of those file formats across platforms um, is possible because of the dynamic interaction of a, a multiple databases through public APIs. Um, you know, so if, if, if you ask the search engine for the name of a business chain and it automatically generates an interactive map uh, of the franchise locations with you know, proximity to your server and real-time traffic information, um, that's something that, that wasn't, wasn't possible um, bef bef before uh, the linking of different kinds of databases. So you could also look at changes, I think, in the status of the unit of what constitutes the page uh, as an HTML construct. So those changes in promiscuous scripting were enabled by the coordination of technologies like AJAX and XHR that permitted the separation of data flow from page presentation. So um, parts of an HTML page can be dynamically exchanged without the entire page as a single object being trashed. Um, and refresh wholesale. And though it's not, an, it's not a necessary connection to this, I think there's an obvious link between those dynamic asynchronous communications between multiple off-site databases and the design of web sites themselves, which in the 1990s right, tended to present a uniform, stateless view of the site. You know, when you called up um, Angel Fire or Alta Vista, um, or something like that. The site looked the same regardless of who accessed it, um, right? And it would look the same again unless it had been an explicitly uh, authored owner update um, if you call it, call it up again later in the day or you call it up tomorrow or you call it up next week. Whereas today, in contrast, of course, um, you know, a site like Amazon presents different information and different pathways to linked pages within the site depending on the navigation histories and the activities of each unique user, right? You see items related to items you viewed or recommendations for you in books or um, inspired by your shopping trends or customers who bought this item also bought uh, and so on, which is to say the content of those categories changes not only with every click that you make but with every click that every other user of the site makes as well. Um, and, and if, the, if the mention of Alta Vista or, or Lycos or Netscape Navigator has you feeling any nostalgia, um, the, the one final change I want to note has to do with how search engines themselves have changed um, over, over time in the ways that they navigate the web. And as this, I'm drawing on what Richard Rogers has demonstrated um, in, in his book Digital Methods, uh, that you can trace the development from just the decade between 1997 and 2007 uh, of search engine architecture, which has promoted algorithmic processes, um, automated procedures, while relegating uh, human-curated 
indices. Um, and you see this both in the front end sort of des design changes, the menu changes, uh, and choices and options for how users search, uh, as well as uh, the, the back end mechanics of, of the actual search mechanisms and logic processing. Um, you know, so recall as, just as an object lesson, Ask Jeeves, uh, which was founded in 1996, um, and tried to capitalize on web search queries um, and other questions answered by, quote, real people as they advertise, right? making, making you wonder about the pressures that the internet interface had put on the, the notion of unreal people. Um, but Jeeves, like some character from Downton Abbey, uh, was, was retired uh, in 2006, uh, and the parent company le leaves the search engine business altogether in 2010 um, in the face of Google's algorithmic search dominance. Um, or maybe for you know, just a related symptom of the same transformation, remember, um, if you can for a moment, the, the, what is now this lost le web of static uh, owner-posted links or sort of hand-chosen, hand-posted blog rules uh, in contrast to the dynamically generated um, galleries of targeted advertisements, uh, statistically related searches, automatically linked um, social network profiles, whole host of data that's sorted and rendered uh, by probabilistic algorithms um, and automated scripted sequences rather than any conscious human selection or decision. Um, this is the discourse network in which most reading and writing today by orders of magnitude is done by machines for other machines. Right? It's online um, in, in which bots and crawlers um, and programs have infested the pathways that, that were once dominated by human, human triggered queries. And moreover, that the replacement of the curated web by an automatized, algorithmically driven internet mirrors the evolution of financial markets alongside which it's developed in the modern information economy. So the investment market segment of that economy has been adapting um, to the realization that curatorial choices by professional money managers um, actively manage funds actually can't outperform randomly indexed big data sampling uh, of markets as a whole. And Paul Stevens um, accordingly has written about the, the strategies of passive indexing in the economic world of big data and its correlation to conceptual writing practices uh, in a really great uh, 2013 article titled uh, Vanguard Total Index conceptual writing, information asymmetry, and the risk society in which Stevens illustrates this sort of self-reflexive relationship between a certain mode of conceptual poetry uh, and, quote, the conditions of its own existence and dissemination in an era of instantaneous global information flows, the ways in which um, indexical forms taken by so, so much con conceptual poetry points both to the source materials um, and to its embeddedness, the embeddedness of those materials in a changing global economy of privatized risk. Um, and w I won't rehearse his argument further. It's really interesting, super perceptive. It's not Paul Stevens. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, Paul Stevens' Vanguard Total Index, uh, conceptual writing, information asymmetry, and the risk society. Uh, it's really brilliant. Um, and... Um, I want to note three other areas today in which technological economic trends overlap um, in ways that have a direct bearing on conceptual writing. So questions of uh, affect, of junk space, and platform, all of which are points of convergence between economics, online culture, um, and all of which have been poeticized by recent works of conceptual writing in ways that I think would have signified quite differently uh, only a decade ago. So affect, um, where economically affective labor, first uh, formally analyzed in the 1970s by Italian autonomist theorists like Maurizio uh, Lazzarato, uh, is one aspect of the immaterial or invisible labor, what, what feminist sociologists would come to call labor in the bodily mode. Um, and it's come to be seen as a, a, you know, an integral stage in post-war economic development. So in, in terms of Michael Hart and Antonio Negri, 
uh, production becomes industrialized, then industrialization becomes informationalized, um, essentially the reconfiguration of, of manufacturing industries as service industries, which is to say, according to their analysis, as affective industries. They write, services are characterized in general by the central role played by knowledge, information, affect, and communication. In this sense, many call the post-industrial economy an informational economy, end quote. Uh, and that, that information economy, uh, governed by the data processing of new media, communicated via the internet, so knowledge, information, communication, uh, brings affect and algorithm together. And for Hart, uh, writing elsewhere, modern economic production at the turn of the millennium was defined by uh, quote, the synthesis of cybernetics and affectivity um, and by its vision of a biopolitical context as the field of productive relations between affectivity and value. But then from the other side of that field, affect itself has been commercialized as a key element of the business model of internet corporations in the age of social media, right? So where affect works not as description, but as a valuation. If you think of the radio button, like input uh, on Facebook, say, and it takes part in the capitalization and the monetization of cathexis, of tweeting, retweeting, ventriloquizing, uh, echoing the, 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 the bluebird of happiness. I think tw Twitter's mascot is not incidental. Um, and in that, in that web of social media, one's affective fluctuations get converted to commercial potential. This is a sort of mise en abyme short circuit between the branding of one's own affective register, right? Look at me, this is me, this is what I like, this is what I repost, uh, this is what I reblog. Um, and then the assimilation of that supposedly individualized branding to the aggregated brand uh, of, of the particular corporate platform. At the same time, ironically, that uh, as, a, as a University of Michigan study uh, recently found, social media use actually predicts declines in user well-being. Right? Basically, the more time you spend on Facebook, the less happy you become. Um, and it, it you know, doesn't matter, doesn't matter how, you, how you feel going in, it doesn't matter how many people like you, it doesn't matter how many things you like, um, even seemingly positive uh, discourse um, can't prevent you from feeling more and more sad the longer you spend on the site. So this, this combination of this insistent rhetoric of positive affect, the bluebird, the, the restricted like button, uh, its commodification by social media, together with the experiential realization of the negative affects produced by social media, make the subject of affect especially resonant when it's taken up by poetry sourced from these very online networks. As, uh, for example, in Diana Hamilton's 2012 book, OK, OK, uh, is from Truck Books, which focuses on the intersection of labor and weeping. Um, crying, of course, being the sort of affective activity par excellence because it indexes emotional states and is itself a precognitive um, physiological response. It's affective both in, in, in the strict and the casual senses of that word. Um, and with, with Hamilton's title suggesting, you know, either an impatient dismissal, okay, okay, um, or comforting sympathy, okay, it's okay. Um, and the work book works to sort of pull back the cubicle uh, divider and reveal the paradoxical inverse to the strictures and expectations of the affective economy. So from the one side, workers in the current economy increasingly tasked with affective labor, right? Certain, uh, certain affective effects uh, have become products themselves, so child care, um, hospice care, counseling, and so on. But even in other fields and industries, workers are asked not just to sell products, um, but f feelings not necessarily related to those products, right? Feelings of, feelings of esteem or well-being um, or, or so on. I, I, I remember going to, um, I remember going to my, my, my local 
the local grocery store one day, and you know the the, the checkout person was you know, she wanted to know what I, what I was going to do that weekend and how things were going. I thought, yeah, you know, I'm a middle aged guy, but she's you know, look, this, this young woman's kind of into me. This is this is great. I feel really good. And then came, you know when I came back the next week, you know the whoever was there just asked exactly the same thing. I realized that actually she she wasn't interested in me. She'd been trained, so. Um, so there's that part of it. And then on the other hand, this is from the other side of the, the, the counter, the business place is still seen as the site in which professionalism requires the suppression of affective response, um, like the uh, performative display of tears at work, um, which, or which, which might or might not align uh, with cultural expectations from other social spheres, such as, such as family. Um, it might be okay to cry at home, but not okay to cry at work. Or as one section of Hamilton's book reads, sometimes it's very hard to separate the work mode from the personal mode and the feeling mode. And sometimes you do get to the point, we've all been there, we've all done that walk of shame past our coworkers from the boss's office to the bathroom. You know, it happens, we cry. We go to the bathroom, we clean ourselves up, we drink a glass of water, um, definitely try to cool down the body in order to stop crying. Work is about facts, it's not about feelings. It's about facts, it's not about whether or not someone likes you, it's not about, you know, whether or not you look good that day, it's about the facts. We've all been there, bottom line, we're all human, we all have feelings, we all get upset, it's not the end of the world, but best avoided if possible. So in this appropriated language of online infomercial articles and discussion boards, Hamilton's text quotes here from uh, an alighted transcript that merges uh, a celebrity host um, and a celebrity guest into this reassuring, this kind of okay, okay. Um, voice, the source I finally discovered, is an embedded video on a social media aggregating site on Howdini.com, the go-to source for new ideas, step-by-step -step information, tips for everything from recipes and entertaining, home improvement, to personal improvement, fashion, beauty, gardening, and healthy living. Uh, and as the caption of the video asks, I think reassuringly, have you ever fought back tears in the office? We've all been there. Melissa Kirsch, author of The Girl's Guide to Absolutely Everything, shares advice on how to deal with crying in the office. Um, and you know, this, we've all been there. Bottom line, we're all human. We all have feelings. We all get upset. Um, ask for that collectivity. But other passages in Hamilton's book, uh, I think, suggest that tears may not be so universal, both, um, both asymmetrically uh, accepted in terms of, of gender, for instance, but also produced in the bodily mode of individuals who may be physiologically predisposed to tearfulness, um, grounded in the affective response of the structurally, chemically sex differentiated limbic system uh, and, and, and its regulation of hormones. And that bodily mode um, emerges in Hamilton's book from the interpolation of, uh, sort of uh, this comically timed message board statement. Um, with a personal web page article by an executive coach, a, a, a certain kind of affective laborer. Um, so it blends this credentialed expert um, and opinionated posters um, in the way the previous section had blended interviewer and, and interviewee uh, and continues. You find yourself having a natural physiological response to feelings that derive from events. Many women cry easily and unexpectedly, especially around that time. Our socialization includes greater latitude than boys to express emotions through crying. In some ways, this freedom serves us well as grown women, especially since September. There is substantial research on emotional intelligence saying this ability makes us better, more effective leaders. We're also better friends, family members, and co-workers. You are not alone. In other words, tears make us look bad. Have a drink. Definitely try to cool the body down. It's okay. Um, okay, okay. Opens uh, with an architectural uh, floor plan of uh, of an office and several pages of disorienting, spatially impossible uh, collage descriptions of cubicles and open plan uh, workspaces, or uh, what Rem Coolhouse has termed junk space, uh, ephemeral, lightweight, quickly dated, blandly cluttered, too soon, shabby um, structures that attract either vacancy or early 
renovation, uh, what are the sort of afterthought partitioning of space with subdivided containers according to an ethos of uniform uh, air conditioned organization and disorienting borders. Um, all those sort of ubiquitous liminal um, transitional structures, the gesture sort of half heartedly toward um, personal space of domestic comfort uh, and then the corporate space of, of re regimentation, not, not quite uh, private, not quite public. I think the, the, the workspaces um, in, in the foyer out there, the uh, computer bank um, downstairs are good examples of this. Um, uh, and these get extrapolated to what uh, a recent NPR report described as suburban corporate wasteland, so office parks. Uh, entire corporate campuses that have been abandoned uh, by corporations like Pfizer, AT&T, Motorola, Amazon, United Airlines. Um, tens of thousands of acres of abandoned 1980s era corporate uh, parks and compounds across the United States. Um, and this at a vacancy rate of 16.6% which is compared to urban rates of 12.4%, of, of so a, a, not just a perceptual sense of these large spaces, but, but, but an actual quantifiable sense. Um, and in large part, in, in large part according to, to analysts, this is because of the digital networks that have allowed more employees to work from home, to stagger their shifts um, flexibly, um, but nonetheless efficiently, and because of the vast, uh, you know, all of the vast accumulations of uh, on-site paper files, which were the information infrastructure of 20th century bureaucratic corporate uh, management, now exists on remote cloud-hosted hard drives. Not to mention all of the corporate homes of 90s era tech startups that were vacated in the wake of the, the bursting dot-com bubble. Um, and that built architecture in turn has its equivalent uh, equivalents in, in online real estate domains, uh, the very domains that drove the profits and the demises of those companies that have moved out of their oversized compounds or, or just moved on entirely, all sorts of abandoned, foreclosed, oversized, dilapidating websites uh, in what Joey Yaris Algazin has called uh, proliferating dead zones, so orphaned websites, failed enterprises like Friendster, um, Napster, Alta Vista, Groove Shark, um, all the broken links, the 404 error pages, missing image files, derailed comment threads, Unix folders keyed to forgotten passwords, web pages with deprecated tags or superseded uh, attributes and operative plugins, altered protocols, software that's no longer supported, the accumulating detritus of spam bots, all the accounts that users forgot to delete from MySpace or AOL, um, and the and or that live on after their users um, are deceased, right? All the aborted, unupdated, and ineradicable spaces. Um, and that doubled sense of defunct is, in fact, the subject of Sophia Lafraga's 2015 book, Literally Dead, all one word, uh, which literalizes that titular phrase, a net speak slang for uh, something that tries to reach beyond the emphatic uh, OMG. Uh, and which, uh, which had been taken as the Instagram handle for an account ostensibly owned by a skeleton named Skelly, I kid you not, um, who snaps selfies um, while posed at brunch or in clubs or at yoga. Um, and what LaFraga recognizes um, there is, I think, the sort of serious side of this minor meme by reprinting the messages left on the walls of deceased uh, Facebook users, replete with um, you know all the, the texting abbreviations and misspellings and occasion, occasional moments of really kind of excruciatingly inappropriate spam. Um, There's 30 hours left, so I'm close to my goal and I can't make it without you. Get these whimsical songs of mine to come to life. I promise even one dollar helps. Uh, or the tragically you know, belated, you know, do, do you have someone with mental illness? I am participating in an overnight walk to raise money for suicide prevention will you give? Um, and throughout, the, the poems in Literally Dead pair that sort of excessive uh, compensatory insistence on, the, on, on expressive positive affect that characterizes the rhetoric of social media discourse, right? 
all emoticon smiles, little less than three hearts, um, all caps, repeated exclamation marks, um, all of this positive affect discourse with the negative affect on display in OK, OK. But here in the guise of really genuinely, um, genuinely heartbreaking sadness, right? grief, anger, despair, um, triangulated by the inexpressible refusal uh, signaled by the book's title, um, Literally Dead, um, which like, you know, OMG or IDK or I Can't Even, asserts this precognitive, affective state of speechless stupor, which I take to be symptomatic of attempts to navigate between um, the sort of social media skilla of cheerful liking and it's the charybdis of, of trolling, right? Um, you get in her book, uh, I'm still in shock, I'm speechless, I can't imagine, I'll never know, no words can explain, I'm lost in words, I can't articulate it, it blows my mind, shocked. It's one of the few times I've been speechless due to news. OMG, 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 OMG. These are the stalled articulations of the literally dead in the face of those who are, in fact, literally dead. Um, while others use the form not just for um, maybe sort of expected tributes or, or personal testimony, but for speaking to the dead in direct address, um, entreating, thanking, encouraging, cursing, requesting, or acknowledging signs, or simply chatting. Um, hey, I'm almost done with a book of poetry. Uh, I fell in love recently, too. Uh, I have so many things to tell you. So many thunderstorms lately. Hey, I'm doing good in school. Saw Thor last night. Uh, I know you would have loved all the Viking stuff, even though I thought it was a bit goofy, um, you know, and, and so on and so on. In other words, a conflation of that 19th century spiritualist sense of medium uh, and the modern sense of new media. Uh, I wasn't planning on writing anything on Facebook. It does no justice as a medium, uh, as one entry veers. Um, and indeed, I think the, the subject of Lafraga's book is not, um, well, it's as much about what, what cannot pass over uh, or live on in technological terms as it is about um, the deceased subjects. So several posts mention their, their medium explicitly, um, inadvertently noting its ability to mix file types, as I was saying, within the same space of the web page. Um, Dude, I wish I could pop open a Facebook message and chat for a minute. Or, um, I remember you sent me a long thing on Facebook chat talking about how you liked my art. No one had ever talked about my work that way before. Uh, or you were just online and we were talking. Or I went through all your pictures on Facebook today. Sometimes uh, I laughed and read the comments. So Literally Dead accordingly emphasizes what is meant to be seamlessly embedded in a web page, one of those hall hallmarks of Web 2.0's interoperability uh, and transmediation, by foregrounding how ungainly those conventions are when they're moved to the platform of the printed codex page. So the randomly generated strings um, you know, of YouTube file address names uh, that are unremarkable when they announce a clickable link uh, or some automatically loading file become un ungainly when typed or read on a page where the directory indexing is all but meaningless, right? HTTP colon uh, slash slash www period YouTube period com slash watch question mark V equals Z B capital Q J P seven K Y P seven capital U slash I know you would love this track. Uh, in contrast, um, thinking of format, in contrast to the paperback format of OK OK, um, uh, which was also released as a PDF, but uh, um, published as a print-on-demand uh, book, Literally Dead, advertises its craft bookness. It comes bound in thick, uh, raw board covers that are letterpress. They support this applique illustration of a, a sort of smartphone-wielding plague doctor. Uh, it has a craft paper hinged spine. They're colored in papers with cursor motif, pattern print, thick, unbleached sheets uh, with visible decorative fiber inclusions, a, a medium, in short, that it announces its distance from the digital rhetoric of its content. Uh, Andy Lafraga emphasizes the difficulty of remediating from screen to codex through the deliberate awkwardness of the book's print page designs in which intentionally low resolution uh, images are positioned with calculating, um, calculated framing 
Uh, there's a really unartful cropping to suggest uh, a browser window or a file that needs to be resized uh, and properly scaled uh, to fit on the page. These, these are images that don't fit on the page, either physically or in terms of their suitability. Uh, Lafraga, in, in this way, captures what I think is the distinct uh, aspects of the current internet, its structure of asynchronous data transfer within the same page, um, which is also at the heart of Joey Yaris Algazan's 2013 Lazarus Project, which includes a three-volume, 1,400-page uh, installment that invokes some 20,000 deceased people's names um, on mydeathspace.com. Again, I'm not making any of this up. Uh, a site that connects obituaries with the social media accounts of people who have died. So like Lafraga, um, I think he's implicitly equating the moribund, defunct web space, right? All these dead end uh, digital artifacts hosted by platforms with breathlessly short lifespans and then human mortality. Um, but his sense of the work's relation to cross-platform dynamics is even more explicit. He writes, what's interesting for me uh, when this material, the description of people's deaths, say, operates in a virtual plane is how it moves. Even long texts are easily transported and stored and their URLs can be shared across multiple platforms. It's not any different than any other piece of data and our phones or laptops don't care about what kind of uh, .doc or .jpeg you're downloading. In a sense, this impoverishment reaches a limit point in the digital environment it becomes nothing more than death infecting information in all its terrifying flatness. So the paradox of multimedia, dynamic web uh, display is that the diversity of the sources are funneled into a much more hegemonic frame of the single portal site and all of the diversity of media, um, right, images, moving images, sound, text, color, etc., are at their base all sharing the same substrate of numerical code. Right? This, this is that terrifying flatness infecting information in all of its impoverished forms. And Yaris Algason hits, hints, I think, at that leveling numerical code underlying his born digital text with a relentless one-zero binary structure of death and resurrection with which he organizes his strophes. Uh, the poem opens... Hannah Puga, 20, allegedly took her own life. Hannah Puga, 20, comes back to life. Eric Halderson, 40, took his own life after a battle with depression. Eric Halderson, 40, comes back to life. Cameron Jacobson, 14, killed himself and his father Kevin committed suicide less than a year later. Cameron Jacobson, 14, and his father Kevin come back to life. Danielle Willardson, 21, was shot by police. Danielle Willardson, 21, sorry, Daniel Willard comes back to life, so on and so on, page after page, volume after volume of these naive reversals that obviously fail to perform their, their performative task, uh, with a result that provokes what Sien Nye has, has termed stuplimity, uh, quote, an aesthetic experience in which astonishment is paradoxically united with boredom. Um, and if, if, that, if the tone of this work strikes a certain sort of slacker, cut and paste pose, the basic structure should be familiar from what Jahan Ramanzani has identified as the compensatory economy of the most canonical elegies, right? Weep no more, uh, woeful shepherds. Weep no more for Lycidas, your sorrow is not dead. Um, or um, Percy Shelley similarly, right, uh, balances that opening. I weep for Adonais, he is dead, with a concluding peace, peace, he is not dead. Um, there's a slight complication, right, because he, he, he does not sleep, he hath awakened from the dream of life. But the, my, my point would be that the absurdity of Yuris Algazan's grammatical reversals suggests maybe a sort of impatient revision to the elevated ambitions of the elegy's poetic legacy. Um, you know, in addition to Shelley's um, prestidigitation, we could think of the, the work of the Renaissance elegy um, to imagine that it, you know, it could restore the natural world to harmonious vivency in, in, in the wake of someone's death. Um, despite that pedigree, though, 
Trisha Lowe, um, who, by the way, is ceremonially killed and resurrected in the middle of volume two of the Lazarus Project, um, accuses Yuris Algazin uh, in an interview, you don't believe in poetry at all, only in platforms. And that faith in platform uh, is the last point of development for conceptual writing that I, I want to remark today. Um, we've seen it engaged in, I think, the themes and forms brought together by Lafraga and Yaris Algazin, um, but the latter further allegorizes his project. Lazarus is published um, by the Troll Thread Collective, uh, an imprint for Born Digital PDF publications, um, and such venues, uh, Gordon Fahler's uh, Gauss PDF would be another example, um, signal a generation of poets who, for the first time uh, in, in at least a century, are not concerned with publishing print books. Uh, you know, that first slim volume of verse, which used to serve as a calling card announcing a poet's bid for entry into, into the Society of Letters. Um, and moreover, that embedded, leveling, ubiquitous digital space means that unlike the first phase of conceptual writing, which happily turned to the internet uh, for source material to plunder, but then transposed it to print um, and for their discussions um, at readings and social gatherings that were free from live tweets um, with the hope that it might be discussed in Xerox zines or in academic journals, even things that would be shelved um, shelved in libraries, magazines distributed um, through the postal service, taking up shelf space at small press distribution. Today, the internet is often completely coextensive with poetic practice. So it's not just a source of material or a model, as we've seen today, to emulate or an ethos to mimic, but also the publishing platform, the very means of distribution, the mode of production, as well as the space of the poetry scene, the venue both for casual um, and professionally critical discussions of poetics. Uh, as, as Matthew Kirschenbaum puts it, it's in an authorship on, on uh, an, an article on authorship and uh, academic scholarship. Uh, he says, nowadays, author statements about their work are laid alongside those of critics and fans, all commingling via the same web services and streams, the same platforms and feeds, and all discoverable by means of a common interface, that search bar at the top of a browser. And in part, then, you know, this, this confluence is, is simply keeping with vernacular practice, which tends towards acts, as I said, of countersigning in a network where files are perpetuated and shunted and reposted and relays across proprietary sites. They're re-blogged or re-grammed or pinned or embedded, um, shared and streamed, alias linked, liked, commented, but they're always kept circulating on the web to which users are connected. Um, and these practices then are encouraged by the commerce of data mining by social media companies, which, as I said, depend on analyzing individual actions against collective statistical aggregates, and we see the affiliations between users, right, regardless of what messages pass between them, as it's self-valuable in information. That is their commodity. Um, at the same time, embedded repetition rhymes with the precise ways in which appropriated poetics uh, of conceptual writing work. Um, so one, one of the founding editors of Troll Thread, for instance, singles out a common point among the collective's diverse practices by noting that conceptual texts and their sources are similarly uh, coextensive. Quote, you don't leave the site of a previous text as you repeat it through appropriative strategies. And under these conditions of textual promiscuity and, and indiscretion of textual overflow, commingling, saturation, the social network of the poet threatens to eclipse the poem itself, uh, which has been rendered all but unnecessary for the production of the discourse about poetics. So not only is the poem no longer required as the occasion for what passes as poetry criticism, but the social network can assume the role of the poetic text itself. And it's under these uh, conditions um, in, 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 in which um, the social network of poets threatens to eclipse their poems um, because those poems have been rendered all but unnecessary. Not only is a poem um, no longer necessary, um, but, but you could have, 
you could have it be replaced by the system in which it would be disseminated. So uh, there's a digital PDF file of a Facebook comment stream, for instance, um, and, and maybe a sort of cautionary example. There's recently published itself as poetry. Uh, the Lulu.com description of this, this print-on-demand collection reads, from 2014, sorry, from 2012 to 2014, the poet and artist Vanessa Place regularly reposted other poets' Facebook status updates as if they were her own. One such appropriated update, reprinted as the cover of this book, prompted a poet to block Place. 38 poets responded to his announcement, Vanessa Place blocked. This book reproduces verbatim their Facebook discussion. Now, despite that claim, the reproduction is actually not quite verbatim, and instead proper names uh, and proprietary names uh, have been redacted. So one representative page, for instance, reads, Poet. Oh, I see now. She's copied my entries on some other social media site as well. I think it's part of a project that she's working on. I guess it didn't bother me, but I can see how feelings could be hurt nine hours ago, like three. Um, <laughs> and it, this displays the, the, all the formatting attributes retained by up-to-date cut-and-paste tools. Um, you know, the blue colors, underlines, bold faces, things that indicate um, links um, that uh, is divulged, but, but it's in a printed book, so it's divulging these vestigial artifacts of what once indicated functioning HTML hyperlinks. Um, and with all those individual names reduced to general terms, right, tweets and the source for this passage above becoming entries on some other social media site, um, the repurposed text, I think, further suggests the specific content matters less than the fact of participatory inscription within the network itself. Um, a troll thread um, from its very inception, the entire discussion was sparked by places of ventriloquism, of uh, self-aggrandizing, self-promoting post by a poet named Dorothea Lasky, um, which boasted, Dear friends, I'm so happy to report that I have a new book of poems coming out this fall from W.W. W. Norton's historic Live Right imprint. The book is called Rome. There are four poems from it in the current issue of the Paris Review, and here is its cover. Um, and for that double detournement of places deturned text, Lulu's anonymous appropriation of Lasky's vocabulary is perfect because a cover, right, is also, of course, um, on the one hand, a disguise or a concealment, a screen or a pretense, um, but also a, a published plagiarism, right? The recording of a song, etc., which has already been recorded by someone else. So where Lasky's writing still moves between the online world and the offline institutions of print, um, with its established Manhattan publishers, its bound journals, Vanessa Place blocked the epitome of this new media regime. It's at once the embodiment and the vanishing point of conceptual poetry. So the first phase of conceptual writing openly challenged ideologies of creativity and originality, uh, foregrounded by the rhetoric of institutionalized creative writing programs. The current phase challenges conceptual writing's own ideologies of artistic value in turn. Um, I mean, it features these poems of entirely appropriate language. It features a priori structures and personal procedures or very modest authorial interventions. Um, but the current mode continues that trajectory of conceptual writing's initial critique of uniquely expressive lyric subjectivity um, by f while also further challenging its residual aspirations to the literary. So conceptual writing's antiquated cathexis uh, to the codex um, and various unrelinquished criteria for aesthetic values um, that conceptual writing never thought to surrender or, or fully dispute. So the new phase of conceptual poetry unhesitatingly takes up those conceptual uh, techniques, but it does so, I, I want to say, towards fundamentally different ends, where troll thread, um, in other words, that disrupted um, or abandoned comment stream might, might be a more openly literal declaration of intent than the sort of flippantly whimsical phrase uh, it might first have sounded like as a title for their imprint. 
uh, as Yaris Algazin describes it, the troll inserts itself into a discourse in order, quote, to derail a conversation between sincere and interested users. So where the online troll thread right, refuses the social values of discursive norms, the new conceptualisms refuse the literary values of even the avant-garde's poetic ambitions. And the primary device of that earlier uh, late 20th century conceptual practice uh, you know, is the blunt reframing of found texts in order to defamiliar defamiliarize their language, to um, critique their implicit presuppositions, maybe to bring out the inherent and unexpected literariness of demotic writing. Uh, but for the poems of our current moment, the interest, I think, lies more in the impossibility of demarcating um, the frame itself. And if earlier works of conceptual writing frequently removed web-based texts from their networks and networks on which they were found uh, in order to recontextualize them elsewhere, the new poetry remains part of the very networks that produced it, continuing um, you know, rather than extirpating uh, their procedures. So if the failure of the first phase of conceptual writing was to imagine that it could separate itself at will from the database culture that it mimed and mined, uh, the danger of the current practice is that readers might still imagine that it somehow wants to. All right, I think that's enough.